I got a bit of material to cover today, so I'd like to get started with, with it. So today's lecture is about linear algebra and its linear algebra revision. If you're comfortable with the linear algebra, you will be wasting an hour of your time by staying behind. Um, but, that, but I do need to bring everyone up to speed with linear algebra. Um, and at least be able to let you know what are the concepts of linear algebra that are sort of very important as we go forward. So um, this means a transition in the course too. Up to now we've been only been doing these discrete variables, binary in particular. Um, to be able to manage uh, continuous variables and do probability with continuous variables, we need to manipulate matrices. Because most of the, vari you know, we're not going to deal with just one variable that's real value variable. We're going to deal with many variables. And the moment we start dealing with many variables, matrices are good data structures to handle many variables. And they're easy to code, they're easy to understand what's going on. Um, so because of that, we need to um, revise linear algebra. Um, I'm going to do the very obvious stuff, start with matrix multiplication, um, go on to eigenvalue decompositions, um, under a restricted domain, proof convergence of the page rank algorithm which you used in homework one, um, and then we'll introduce a bunch of definitions called, um, that are very useful for the rest of the course. They, they will basically be super important when we're trying to design like neural network predictors and so on because all of those models will essentially um, are coded using linear algebra. Okay, so that's the intent of today's lecture and I'm going to do this old school since it's just a linear algebra revision. Um, so matrix multiplication. I have a vector, so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to have a matrix. A matrix will have a entries, so A11, A12, A21, A22. So it's just a data structure where the, the guys inside it are numbers. Um, and the matrix vector multiplication um, will be defined, um, I'm just going to say it's going to give me as an output a vector where each entry of the vector, say y1 is equal to a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2. Okay? <coughs> Basic stuff. Um, Let's say that the matrix A times the vector y, x gives me the vector y, for simplicity. I'm using, I'm underscoring with one bar to indicate the vector, and I'm underscoring with two bars to indicate the matrix. Okay? In, um, in, in the notes, especially in the homework, um, typically vectors are bold. Um, lowercase and matrices are sort of bold uppercase. Okay, so that's matrix vector multiplication. Um, it's also clear that y2 is equal to a21 times x1 plus a22 times x2. That's the definition of matrix multiplication. So in effect what we're saying is that yi is equal to A I A I one times X one plus A I two times X two. Okay? And then you can just plug A I equal one or two. So we can actually write this most succinctly as the sum of a j of a i j times 
x j. Okay, so that's another way to write matrix vector multiplication. So we're left with three ways that are essentially the same thing. We can either use this form here. Um, we can use the matrices, or we can for short just use the, the symbols to denote matrices and vectors. There's one more that turns out to be useful, and it's the following one. Sometimes a matrix can be written as just two column vectors. And these column vectors will be as in the expression above. What this lets me do is it allows me to express, well, It allows me to, ex oh, let's get the screen one, sure. Okay. It allows me to express the, matri the, the matrix A <coughs> as X1, A1 plus X2, A2. Okay, and this is the, the fourth form in which we can write the matrix vector product. This one is saying that a matrix vector multiplication is just saying that um, the answer is a linear combination of the columns of A. It's just taking a linear combination of the uh, columns of A where the coefficients are um, the x's, x1 and x2. Okay. So it turns out that being able to see it in all these three, four forms is very useful. And when we're manipulating expressions, I will interchangeably move from one form to the other form. So these, even though obvious, are actually very important. It's very important to be able to change between one and, and the other. OK, so I'm going to do a little example. Should it, on the past slide, Pardon? The last box, did you mean to write y equals Oh, sorry. Um, you're, you're right. Um, thank you. I had a typo there. I meant to write it like this, which is obviously equal to the vector y. Thank you. All right. So. Um, let's look at an example that is uh, quite interesting. And let's assume that we have a vector that's of the form alpha 1 minus alpha. And we multiply it times a matrix that's of the form theta 1 minus theta um, beta times 1 minus beta to give us um, a vector uh, y. Okay. So, and it's, and then I'm going to write it like this to indicate that it's going to be y1, y2. Okay, so I'm putting a transpose. Um, okay, so I should define that. So if I have y equal y1, y2, y transpose is just changing the order. Sorry about that. Okay, The transpose of a vector. Um, we, I will now make the following claim. If my matrix is such that each row sums to 1, and if the vector that I left multiply that matrix has entries that sum to 1, 
the claim is that the enters of y sum to y. Okay? So if I have in general x transpose times g equal y transpose so if and <coughs> the sum over all the entries of xi is equal to 1 and the sum the sum over the j's of the entries of gij is equal to 1 for all i then the sum of the y j's is equal to 1. Okay. So that's my claim. This will be very useful to understand how why Google converges. So let's call this a lemma. Think of a lemma as a simple rule that you get to prove. So how do we go about proving this? So we know that yj is equal to the sum over i of xi times gij. From matrix vector multiplication. And if we now sum both sides um, of a j, we have that the sum of a j of yj is equal to the sum over i of xi gij and <coughs> the sum of a j. And if I swap sums, I will have sum over i of xi, sum of a j of gij, which is equal to the sum over i of xi, which is equal to 1. Okay. So if the entries of the vector that I'm left multiplying the matrix G sum to 1, the entries of the vector after I multiply will sum to 1. So remember in your homework 1, you took a, an arbitrary vector whose entries sum to 1, and you kept multiplying it times this Google matrix. Um, that vector, the, the answer, is always something that sums to 1. Okay, so if you start with a probability vector, and you have a conditional probability matrix, you will end up with a uh, after doing multiplication, you still end up with a probability vector. So you remain in the space of probabilities. And that's a very useful property. Okay, so um, so that's it for that small property that we will use soon to discuss convergence of Google. But before we go there, I first need to introduce um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's start with an example. Suppose you have a matrix um, that's of the form uh, 1 minus alpha, alpha, and then beta 1 minus beta. Okay. Um, I'm going to want to come up with an expression, a decomposition of this matrix of the following form. Okay. Um, the matrix times the vector is going to be equal to, the s <coughs> to a scalar times the vector. Okay. Sometimes I will also want to use um, an equivalent slight um, expression which is of the following form. <coughs> 
Now, what, this, what is this equation saying? This is saying a matrix is a lot of numbers. If you take a lot of numbers and you multiply them as a vector, that's the same thing that if you just take this one single number, lambda, and multiply the vector. Okay. So on the left hand side, you have lots of numbers. On the right hand side, you have one number. And when you multiply the vector, they're the same thing. So that's actually going to be very profound for learning because learning to a large extent is about compression. There's a big world out there. We managed to compress a lot of uh, what the world's about into a very tiny amount of space. So whenever we see a mathematical expression where you have a lot of numbers on one side and just a few on the other side, um, these things are of interest because they give us an opportunity to do data compression. And so um, as we will see in the next lecture, uh, the, you can actually compress images, you can compress all sorts of data. And over the next few uh, lectures, we'll see how to compress, um, you know, document databases and so on, just using eigenvalues. Um, okay, so I'm going to call, actually I'm sort of getting ahead, but I know most of you have seen this, so I'll be going quickly. So these guys will be called eigenvalues. Um, these guys I will call left eigenvectors. Okay. Their physical meaning and so on will become much more clear as we move on with the lectures. Um, okay, so, and if, if they're on the right, they're called the right eigenvectors um, or eigenvectors for short. What's on the line? Lambda is a number. Um, yeah, lambda is a number. So what, what I mean is um, uh, left of A or right of A. <laughs> lambda is a scalar, so it, it's a word that can swap. Okay, so by right, I mean right of A. Okay, so how do we solve this? Um, so let's assume that we have um, a x equal lambda x. So it must be that a x minus lambda x is equal to zero. Okay, so just move it to the other side. Um, now, I'm going to introduce a matrix that's called the identity matrix. So it has ones, um, it kind of looks like this. Okay, so it's a matrix that has ones in diagonal, zeros elsewhere. That's the identity. That's the identity matrix of size three, the identity matrix of size two. Um, by definition, it's just um, something that only has the, uh, two ones, so it's two by two. Um, property of the identity that you can easily check, if you multiply any vector times the identity, you get the vector. So we can then go back to this expression, and we can just plug in the identity there, because the identity times the vector is still the vector. And so we can then summarize this as a minus lambda i times x is equal to zero. Okay, so I can group the terms. The reason why I need to uh, introduce the identity is because if I don't, then the dimensions of a and lambda i wouldn't match because lambda is a scalar, a is a matrix. Okay, now that the dimensions match, um, what I essentially have here is a linear system that is saying that A, uh, which is sorry, 1 minus alpha <coughs> minus lambda, alpha, and then beta, um, 1 minus uh, beta minus lambda times x1 and x2 which are the components of x, is giving me uh, essentially zero, a vector of zeros. 
Okay. Now, for this to be zero, um, either so let let's assume that I want the x's to be independent to form a basis. So in other words, x1 is not a constant times x2. If x1 is not a constant times x2, then the only way this can be zero is if um, How many of you have seen determinants? I'm wondering to what extent I need to revise all this stuff. Determinant of a matrix? Okay, most people are with that. Um, if not, I'll, I'll just go quickly. Um, for this to be zero, I'm just gonna say that the determinant has to be zero. And I will define the determinant next because most of you are with me. Uh, one minus alpha minus lambda alpha beta 1 minus beta minus lambda. The determinant for a 2 by 2 matrix um, is just equal to the product of the diagonals minus oh, thank you and matrix as well. Pardon? In matrix, same thing with matrix as well. Oh, I also put a lambda there. It should be a lambda. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the determinant has to be zero. And if in, to find the lambdas, you just need to find the lambdas that make um, And this is, I don't know if you remember this from your linear algebra revision. If x1 is not a constant times x2, then the only way you can get zero is if the columns of A actually are A times A is a constant times another column. Uh, one column of A is a constant times another column of A. And that only happens when the determinant is zero. Okay, when we Put in the determinant, we get the characteristic, um, something that's called a characteristic equation. We solve for lambda, and we only typically did this for two by two and three by three matrices um, in first and second year. You can't do this for more than five, not only because it's hard, but because of a theorem that actually says you can't. Um, and um, so you actually, Typically, we only compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors using computers because it's impossible to get them exact. All right, so the next thing is to solve for lambda, and I'm just going to do this quickly by inspection. I know that if I choose um, lambda, lambda equal to 1, I, I will get um, um, alpha times beta minus alpha times beta, so they cancel, so I get zero. Um, the other way I can get zero is if I choose lambda <coughs> one minus alpha minus beta. Okay, so that solution also allows me to get a zero. So if you just plug in one minus alpha minus beta for lambda, you'll see that you'll get um, it all adding up to zero. Okay, so, um, and this example for a two by two arbitrary stochastic matrix, that is a matrix whose, for each row, the columns sum up to one, shows that the eigenvalue, regardless of what alpha and beta are, the largest eigenvalue is always one. Okay. This is actually true for any size matrix that is stochastic matrix, for any condition of probability table. I'm not proving the eternal case, but for a two by two matrix, here we are. That's what we have. Now, if we look at the eigenvector of this matrix, Can you repeat that last one? it is also true that for an arbitrary matrix that is provided as a stochastic matrix, um, its largest eigenvalue is one. And is there always an eigenvalue that's what precisely one? That is correct. Okay. Is there a way it to exists? Here it's pretty like elegant the way that you could find the um, eigenvalues in terms. No, of it's it's not an easy theorem to prove. 
I w uh, the, the theorem that proves it is called the Perron Frobenius theorem. I would need three classes to prove it no, to I you. Really prove, but, um, like I see how you have the eigenvalues in terms of the entries of the matrix. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if we ever, if I ever see a two by two matrix, I just can right away write down the eigenvalues immediately by, by just rearranging it into that form. Is there a right. similar like way of coming up with like the three eigenvalues for a three by three matrix, or do you know of any? For a three by three, it's still easy to do. So you, I could still do it. It just would be more like work. Alpha one, alpha two, and one minus. Yeah, yeah, you could do it totally for a three by three. No problem. Good idea for a homework exercise. Okay. Um, the next thing we do is. Um, You've all done eigenvector exercises. You can, you can also show that if you, if you, if I look at the eigenvector now, suppose I have um, AX equal 1X, uh, oops, just one bar. So in other words, if I have, um, A minus 1i times x equals 0. I would just write this as uh, 1 minus alpha minus 1 is minus alpha, alpha, beta, minus beta, tells me that one possible solution for this to be the case is to choose x to be equal to say 1 1. <coughs> okay. So the vector of 1's which I often denote by just a 1 with a bar under that's um, a vector of um, and it has to be because x1 one, 1 minus alpha plus 1 times alpha gives you a 0, and beta minus beta also gives you a 0. Um, so 1 is the eigenvector. The vector of 1 is an eigenvector uh, for this matrix. Uh, more interesting is the left eigenvector. Um, the left eigenvector would be x1, x2 times the matrix A, which is A minus lambda I, which is minus alpha, alpha, beta and minus beta, that also gives me a vector of zeros. In other words, x1 minus alpha x1 plus beta x2 is equal to zero, and alpha x1 minus beta x2 is equal to zero, and I can choose x to be equal to um, beta over alpha plus beta and then alpha over alpha plus beta. If I choose x to be this vector, that vector satisfies those equations. Okay. The nice thing as well about this vector is that the sum of the entries is equal to 1. <coughs> so in other words, the left eigenvector, the left eigenvector is a probability vector. Okay? So that was the other thing we had, we noticed with page rank. Um, so I've basically been going over the 2 by 2 case of page rank. So the large eigenvector is 1. And the eigenvector, the left eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 1 happens to be something that's a probability distribution. Okay. Now let me give you um, um, some property. Um, basically, I'm going to go quickly over a 
simple sketch, a simple proof of uh, Google's page rank. It's, and I'm saying simple because it makes, I will make strong assumptions to get the proof through. But the proof essentially tells you how you can easily manipulate eigenvalues to actually be able to discuss convergence of algorithms. So, so recall that the, the, the Google algorithm, what we did, is we took an initial vector, pi naught, we multiplied that vector times the Google matrix, and that gave us a vector pi 1. We then would take pi 1, we would multiply that times the Google matrix to give us pi 2. And we kept doing this for, I don't know, m times. Right? Or equivalently, um, equivalently, we simply could state that <coughs> pi naught transpose times g to the m minus 1 is equal to pi m transpose. Because we keep multiplying by g. So we have pi naught, we multiply by g, that gives us pi 1. We multiply by g again, gives us pi 2, um, and so on. Actually, that should have been m. Start at 0. Okay. make myself some room here. Okay, so that was the algorithm. And so I'm going to make the following assumptions. I'm going to um, let xi transpose g equal lambda i xi So now I'm going to write the eigenvalue, the left eigenvector equation for G and assume G and N by N matrix has N distinct eigenvalues. Okay. That's an assumption we're going to make. Proving the result in more general is harder, but this assumption um, will allow us already to see something very cool. So let's assume that it, um, the matrix has n eigenvalues that are d different from each other. Um, and, and let's also suppose the xi form a basis. What that means is that any vector, for example, pi naught, or oh, and here I dropped I sometimes forget to put the bars. I just put them there. Okay. That means that the vector pi naught can be written as a linear combination for some coefficients, arbitrary coefficients, ci of the eigenvector. A basis just means that you can represent one vector in terms of the other vectors. So a typical example is when you have the vectors 0, 1 and the vector 1, 0 and then any vector on this 
Um, any vector on the plane can be represented in terms of those two bases, 0, 1, and 1, 0. So in general, in Rn, we could have, you know, so in 3D, we would have three vectors. And as you go up, you would just need as many vectors as dimensions to be able to um, uh, specify the location of a vector, pi naught. So pi naught um, is assumed to be represented as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. Okay, if this is true, then pi naught transpose g is just equal to the sum from i equal 1 to n of ci xi times g, which is equal <coughs> Now, xi transpose g, let me make this transpose, ci, uh, xi transpose g by definition is just lambda i xi transpose. Okay. If I take now pi 1 transpose g, This is essentially pi 1. If I take pi 1 transpose g, this is equal to the sum from i equal 1 to n of ci lambda i xi transpose times g. Because I repeat the same argument. Um, when I multiply xi times g, that is just equal to lambda i xi transpose, and so I get lambda i squared. And this is, in particular, this is equal to pi naught transpose times g squared. Okay, it's the same thing if I had pi naught to multiply by g twice. <coughs> and here I'm going to do a leap of faith. I'm going to ask you to do a leap of faith, and this is something you can check at home. Pi naught transpose times g to the m is going to be equal to the sum from 1 to n of ci, I mean you couldn't do this for more steps and you can convince yourself that because we're always replacing the xi times g by lambda xi, all we're doing is we keep increasing the power of lambda. And so we can just write this expansion in this form. <coughs> so now I have an expression for the last part of the multiplication, for the m step of the multiplication and that if we break it into terms, it's just C1 lambda 1 to the m times x1 transpose plus C2 lambda 2 to the m times x2 transpose and so on. I keep forgetting the bars. I've got all the bars there. Okay, so plus dot, dot, dot. So basically we're saying that the vector multiplied times the matrix M times is just a sum of C times lambda times the eigenvectors. Now, when we compute this, the order of the eigenvalues is arbitrary. Right? So I can always pick an, uh, an arbitrary ordering. So I'm just going to label them 
such that lambda 1 is the largest, lambda 2 is the next one, um, lambda 3 is the next one, and so on. So I can just order my eigenvalues. I'm choosing the labels of them so that they're ordered. So I can make 1 is the largest and then 1 minus alpha minus beta is the second largest in the previous expression. If this is true, then what happens to that last expression? It looks a lot scarier, by the way, when you look it up there <laughs> and then on my screen. You have a bunch of, we're, we're summing a bunch of terms where lambda 1 is always guaranteed to be bigger than lambda 2. So if m is very large, only the first term matters. Right? Because lambda 1 to the m is going to be so much bigger than lambda 2 to the m or lambda 3 to the m and so on. So we basically are saying that pi naught times g to the m is going to be approximately this arbitrary constant c1 times lambda 1 to the m times x1. But we know we know that the left hand side sums to 1. Okay? Because that was the lemma that we proved. We proved because pi naught sums to 1. If you multiply by matrix G, whose each row sums to 1, it's going to give us a vector pi 1 that whose entries sum to 1. And entries of pi 2 sum to 1. Okay, I lost the battery, so I'll, I'll raise my voice. So the entries of pi 2 is still sum to 1. And, and pi 3 and pi 4 and so on. So it must be that the entries of this vector here, let's call this vector pi m, it must be true that the sum of all the entries of that vector are 1. Still. Can we close to one? Pardon? They will be close to one. There will not there will be one. That was the lemma that we proved. <coughs> we proved this lemma. If you have y equal a times x and if the sum if the entries of x sum to one, and if for each row of A, the column sum to 1, then the entries of Y sum to 1. But we have dropped a bunch of terms as well. That's right. But now, let's say that I take my Y, whose entries sum to 1 by this <coughs> lemma, okay. and I multiply it by A again. I will get a vector Z, whose entries sum to 1, right? And so, if I start with pi naught G, gives me pi 1 with entry sum to 1. So then pi 1 times g gives me pi 2 whose entry is also sum to 1. And for each pi, the entry is sum to 1. So it must be true that for the last one, the entry is sum to 1 in the limit. So what, what I'm, and this is just a constant. So pi is the normalized eigen vector x1. So the final so you the final answer will be a probability vector, this entry sum to 1, and it will be in the direction of x1. Okay. 
So the scale of that vector will be such that the times to one, the direction will be x1. If c1 is zero to start with, then that constant will be zero. So provided you is it possible taking a linear combination where you don't take the obvious c1 equal to zero. Yes. But is that obvious to if you have some unknown like some state you don't know how it decomposes into the into the eigenspace can you like can you by looking at it can you say no this state is uh, an, an island it's never going to reach a stationary distribution because it has c1 zero like if it was just some different population let's avoid that trivial solution so I'm just going to avoid the trivial solution. I'm assuming that it is a linear combination um, of the other um, eigenvectors. Um, if one was zero, it means that it lives in a lower subspace. So I'm not going to deal with that case. I'm really picking the easy case here, a full basis. Provided the matrix, um, which will not be the case with the Google matrix, so it having a full basis because there's going to be dependencies there between one matrix and the other. But if you constructed this matrix so that it was all the eigenvectors were independent, and then by just applying matrix vector multiplication, you're guaranteed to find a unique solution. And that unique solution is a probability vector. And that's essentially a, under very strong assumptions, proof of the paper algorithm. <coughs> Now, this also gives you a recipe for doing more. Um, and you can, just a second. And you can do more because if you, if you look at this, what this is saying, if, if you take an initial vector and you multiply it times the matrix many times, you can get something that approaches the eigenvector. An eigenvector of g. And this, in fact, is, called, is one of the methods that your computer uses to produce eigenvectors for you when you call uh, you know, some function to compute eigenvectors. This is called the power method. And uh, with a little bit of modification, I could give you the, gen the general version of the power method. Um, and this, whenever you compute eigenvectors from now on, you'll either be using this method or you're going to be using a different method called Laxus, which we cover in um, CPSC 402. Okay. But so eigenvectors are always computed numerically. And for the rest of this course, we will use them, but you will use a computer to generate them. We're not going to be solving three by three systems, because those are two simple systems. They don't have, the real world is thousands by thousands, <coughs> billions by billions. And so we're going to do everything numerically. If it's very urgent, because I'm running out of time. I can ask afterwards. I have office hours afterwards. Okay, so the last thing I want to cover is I can write a matrix times a set of vectors x1, x2, up to xm. So these are just different ways 
Brighton AXI equal lambda I XI. Okay. And I can use matrix <coughs> this. I can either write it in this form, which I'm saying it's you have the eigenvalue equation for each of the eigenvectors, or I can just group the terms. Uh, in particular, I have that AX1 is equal to lambda 1x1, AX2 is equal to lambda 2x2, and so on. The advantage of writing it in this way is that I can then say that A times this matrix of eigenvectors X is equal to X <coughs> times this matrix which is diagonal with the eigenvalues in the diagonal which I'm going to call big lambda. This leads, if I multiply both sides by x inverse I get this following the composition The matrix A can be decomposed as a product of the matrix of eigenvectors and the matrix of eigenvalues <coughs> in the diagram. This decomposition is going to be extremely important. Um, it's saying that a, the matrix A typically for us, as we move forward, will be an image, will be a collection of text, and so on. On the right hand side, what we will do is we will get a decomposition of that matrix into all its components. And we'll be using this. Um, with, with a lot of practical examples. Finally, if A is equal to A transpose, i.e. A is symmetric, then A can be written as 